many of you, you probably don't know a lot of, of my story and ministry story. So just briefly, I, I actually moved to Portland in 1997 to start ministry uh, at, at a local church in one of our communities in 1997. So from 1997 to 2015, just maybe a few months in between, had some downtime, but I've been on staff at a church. From 1997 to 2015, either as pastor, lead pastor, associate pastor, and or student pastor. So you keep my son in your prayers, right? Uh, I've, I've, I've been in all those roles. Um, and it's been a blessing. But in 2015, I'm, to be transparent with you, man, I was burnt out, wore out, mentally, mostly, spiritually, physically, from ministry and it took a toll on me so I needed a season of rest in doing so in 2015 I went back into the circle, uh, secular world per se and, and started work again did some yard work for a gentleman for a couple months and then I was hired on into one of the local factories and I was there for almost five years and then the last four years I've been doing government work for the city of Portland. Please do not hold that against me. I have nothing to do with your water bill. I just read your meter, okay? So if you got an argument about how much you got to pay, don't come see me after service. Don't have anything to do with that. So for the last nine years or so, I've been back into the secular world uh, working, providing for me and my family. Now, here's, here's the deal. One thing that I've realized in this journey was but for so long I was on staff at a church and I began to transition out of that into a different area of work but also a different area of ministry because oftentimes we, get, we find ourselves identified to a position and a title instead of what we really are. We are born again, Christ followers of Jesus. So a title at a church doesn't define me. A title even in my job doesn't define me. What defines me is what Jesus Christ is to me. He's my Lord, my Savior, Jesus Christ. That's, what, that's how I'm identified today. So I've made that transition, and it's okay. Because one thing I've realized over time, God still uses you just in a different format of ministry. I get to see a lot of people throughout the week that I normally wouldn't get to see on staff at a local church. And I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm just being transparent with you. That doesn't mean that one day I will go, not go back to a staff on church. What I'm saying is, in this present moment, God has placed me where I'm at, not just to work and to, and to uh, make a living and provide, but also to do ministry. Ministry is just in a different format, but it's still ministry. So my challenge to you today is, how do you love your neighbor in the workplace, because it's difficult. How do you love your co-worker that doesn't like you, that doesn't have anything in common with you, that person that doesn't live a Christ-like attitude or mindset, a person that's unchurched, a person that's going through a struggle? How do you deal and how do you do ministry in the workplace? Because I want you to know something. Just because it's different doesn't mean that it's not impossible to share the love of Jesus with everyone so that everyone can fall in love with him. So we all have our different agendas, we, our political views, our church views, all these things. So how do we work around that as Christ followers to love our neighbors in the workplace? I like what I read here not too long ago. They're going to put the quote on the screen. You might want to write this down because it's real. Okay, Christians are not called to love their neighbor based on the terms set by their neighbor, but by the standards set by the Lord. Because it's easy to love those co-workers that we have a lot in common with, right? We all have the same haircut. We all like to color orange. Come on, balls. Huh? We all like to go to the beach. We all like to go to... It's easy to coexist with people that you can coexist with that have a lot of things in common. 
But how do you do that in the workplace and to, and to love them and value them just like God loves and values you? How does that happen and how does that work? Well, I'm glad you asked because Galatians chapter 5 teaches us this. How do you live this love out toward our neighbor? It's found in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 25. Let's bring that scripture up again. Look what it says. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness. Look. Next one, please. Gentleness and self-control. There is no other law against these things. So the Holy Spirit... Third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. Once you come to know Christ, the Spirit dwells within you. And because that it dwells within you, it's our opportunity to live this out each and every day. So the fruit of the Spirit is revealed by Christ through Christ. In other words, God's done a great work in you now that he wants to do a great work through you. No matter where you find yourself in this this life's journey. No matter what your culture may be at the workplace. The question I want to challenge you with today is, how are you changing your culture at the workplace? I I love what Pastor Brandon said several years ago. He says, are you a thermometer or a thermostat? Are you changing the culture of your place of work? Whether it be in an office, whether it be in the field, whether it be in a classroom, or whomever you may be around. See, when we live out what Christ has done in us, These characteristics or these attributes will be revealed through everything that we do. So how do we live these characteristics out of Christ through the fruits of the Spirit in the workplace? And there are five things today that are vital. I believe that if we'll just follow these five steps, it will make us easier. It will make it easier on us to live out the fruits of the Spirit and to be an effective co-worker in the workplace. Not just fulfilling your responsibility on your job, because we all have a responsibility, but changing the culture in Christ. Changing the culture in Christ. And it may be difficult for some of you. Several years ago, I was actually working at a warehouse. I was a forklift operator. And I was introduced, there was only five or six of us there. And I was introduced to the co-workers there. And one of them pulled me to the side who'd been there for 20-something years. And he was going to show me around the, the place and talk a little bit about what our responsibilities are and all this. And I mean, he wasn't just five minutes in. I was with him uh, on an individual basis. And first thing he said to me was this, well, I hear that you've been a former pastor in this community. I said, yes, sir. He said, well, I hear that you're... You did this and you do this. How he found this out, I have no clue. But he heard it, right? I said, yes, sir, I have. He said, well, this is what I don't want you to do. I don't want you to throw your religion on me. And I laughed, just like you just did. Because this is what I told him. I said, well, you don't have anything to worry about, brother. I'm not going to throw my religion on you. Because I don't have religion. I got a relationship with Jesus. I said, but this is what I am going to do. I'm going to love you unconditionally. I'm going to serve you whether you like it or not. I'm going to love on you so much, you'll go home and love your wife better. Huh? Guess what he did? He never scheduled me to work along beside him. But a few weeks ago, I met him right up here at Woodard Tire and had conversation with him. He didn't ignore me. He didn't shun me. Come to find out, 17 days later after that conversation, he died of pancreatic cancer. We never know, do we, who we come in contact with. And how that we can live out these fruits of the Spirit to those that we do life with and even work with. So today, let's look into what God has for us. Number one, how can we share the love to our neighbor in the workplace? Number one, it begins in prayer. This is not a cop-out. 
This is not a cop-out statement. This isn't just a religious statement. This isn't just a pastor statement to you as an audience because it's real. How do you start your day can determine how your day goes. When you start out in, in prayer and solitude, we practice this at our house. I can speak to that. Phyllis and I can speak to that. We spend time in silence and solitude and in prayer. We pray silently, but we also pray together. The power of prayer makes a difference. I'm going to prove it to you. Look with me. Mark chapter 1, verses 35 through 39. Before daybreak the next morning, Jesus got up and went out to an isolated place to pray. Later, Simon and the others went out to find him. When they found him, they said, everyone is looking for you. But Jesus replied, we must go on to the other towns as well, and I will preach to them too. That is why I came. Notice before they went out what Jesus did. He spent time in solitude, and he spent time in prayer. Before he went and preached, before he went to cast out demons, before he went to heal the sick, he spent time in prayer and he spent time in solitude. So if you begin your day with prayer and solitude, you never know who's going to cross your path throughout the day that you can be a powerful influence on. A word of encouragement, a word of love, a word of just hope. Why is that? Because... It's our job to do that. And it's our responsibility to do that. And if you call yourself a Christ follower today, that should be intentional. That should be your DNA today. To share the love of Jesus with everyone so that everyone will fall in love with him. I didn't come up with that. It's real. But how does it start? It starts and begins with solitude and prayer. I don't know what your work environment looks like to you, but I can speak a little bit about mine. When we go into the break room, we actually have a prayer board up on our wall there in our break room. Write down the needs of our family, our friends, co-workers. Matter of fact, this week I had the opportunity on uh, this past Monday to walk into the office of a young lady whose brother is dying of cancer. And I just stopped by momentarily just to say, hey, I'm thinking of you. And I said, I would love to pray for you and your family during this time. Listen, prayer matters. It matters in your personal life, and it matters in the lives of others. Do you know right now each and every one of you are a result of prayer? This church prayed for you in 2012 before it even launched. You're sitting in a seat that was prayed for and prayed over way before you filled the seat this morning. The power of prayer still works. And it's important that we begin our day in prayer. Number two, listen and look for opportunities. Listen and look for opportunities. I had a gentleman tell me this many, many years ago. He said, Rob, I was talking to him about ministry. And I said, tell me a little about, he said, Rob, if he said this. He said, if you create availability, availability will create opportunities. If you create availability, availability will create opportunities. And, I, and I've stuck by that for nearly 30 years. That's why I'm here today. Why is that? Availability creates opportunities. And it's the same way in your own personal life at your workplace. But when we listen and we look for those opportunities to share the love of Jesus with everyone so that everyone will fall in love with Him, then you will have those moments when you can have a personal conversation with your coworkers. But you got to look and listen for opportunities. Now, I'm not talking about meddling in somebody's business. You know, well, man, don't be getting up in my business. I'm not getting in your business. Man, I'm just loving on you. Look what Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 says. For we are God's masterpiece, every one of us. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can go, so we can do the good things he's planned for us long ago. He has a plan for you. 
He prepared a long time ago, way before you even come into existence, for you to do the good work of Jesus, to share Jesus, to share love, and to be patient and kind and gentle and affectionate to others. So the, how does that happen? Even in a workplace, you've got to listen and look for opportunities. How do you know that this works, Rob? I'm glad you asked. You'll find out. Stick around for a few more minutes, and I'll tell you. It works. I promise you, it works. Listen and look for opportunities. Many years ago before, right when I first started in ministry, um, I went to a good older pastor friend of mine. He's gone to be with the Lord now. And uh, I went to him, and I was looking for pastoral advice. Have you ever go to your pastor or someone on staff or a high-level leader, and, and you, you're going for for advice, and you're just waiting for a big dynamic, blow you over type answer to help you. Well, I was in that place, so I went to uh, to his house and sit down, and had conversation, and this is what I asked him. I said, "Brother, I said, uh, what is the hardest and the easiest thing when it comes to ministry?" He said, "Rob, I can sum that up in two words. Now listen, I'm sitting on the edge of the couch, man." You know, waiting for this blow-me-over answer. And this is what he said. What's the easiest and the hardest thing when it comes to ministry? And here's the two words. You ready? The people. (laughs) The people. Because everybody, even though you're created different, because some of you got a whole lot more hair than I got. We're still created in God's workmanship. We're created in his image. To share Jesus with others. Listen and look for opportunities. To allow these characteristics and these attributes of the fruits of the Holy Spirit to live in us. Not just live in us, but live through us. To others. Number three, we've got to exercise our obedience. We have to exercise our obedience. First Peter chapter 3. Finally, all of you should be of one mind, sympathize with each other, love each other as brothers and sisters. Be tenderhearted and keep a humble attitude. Don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. That is what God has called you to do, and he will grant you his blessing. Exercise your obedience. Exercise. In other words, put your faith in action. Put your faith in action. I said this earlier, and I'm going to challenge you again with this statement. Are you a thermostat or a thermometer? Because, see, they do different things. A thermostat tells the temperature. Thermometer thermometer tells the temperature. Thermostat dictates the temperature in the room. So to exercise your faith at your workplace, are you a thermostat or a thermometer? Are you living out the goodness and the grace of God at your workplace towards your coworkers? That person that gets on your last nerve, that person that don't have anything in common with, that person that doesn't want you to put your religion on them, that person that shares things that's ungodly, that person that, you know, is hard to communicate with or even work along beside, are you exercising your faith in front of them? Because are you doing good or are you returning evil with evil? Are you doing good? Are you returning evil with evil? One of the things that I've tried to to implement at my workplace is quite often I'll stop by Hardee's. And right now they got a good deal. If you like breakfast at Hardee's, two for five dollars on biscuits, man. Come on. And I'll pick me up about four of them. Not for me. I know this figure tells something different, but it's not for me. And what I will do is I will take those to work, and I will put them in an office, 
and put a sticky note on them and say, Jesus loves you and I hope you have a blessed day. And don't even sign it. There are times that people will have a conversation with me on advice. There are times that people will call me, say, Rob, can you come to my office? I need to talk to you about something. Why is that? Because I've tried to exercise my faith and obedience in front of them. I didn't say that to Pat Rob on the back. I'm just telling you what can happen. Are you changing the culture at your workplace? Are you exercising your obedience in front of your coworkers? And you're loving them unconditional no matter who they are and what they're doing. What's the lifestyle that they're living? Because at the end of the day, and this is not a cliche, this is fact too. You may be the only Bible they read. It's real. So are you exercising your faith and obedience in front of them? Number four, see everyone in God's image. How do you see people? Because, listen, I'm going to be real with you today. Generation Church isn't because of this wonderful facility that we have. You're Generation Church. You are. The people. What's the good and the bad when it comes to ministry? The people. Guess what? You're the people. You. You. So you got to see everyone in God's image. Look at the scripture. Genesis chapter 1 verse 17. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them. You know what our problem is sometimes, church? I think sometimes, church, we forget what it means to be lost. There was a time that you acted like that. There was a time that you talked like that. And I hope and pray you don't talk like that now. But there was a time. There was a time that you downtrodded the church. There was a time that you said, man, I ain't going to church. I'm not going there. You know, when I met Phyllis's dad for the very first time, he asked me, he said, Rob, you go to church anywhere? I said, no, sir. He said, why not? I said, well, man, I'm just as good as the hypocrites that go. You know what Rudy said? Well, I don't, can't think of a better place where a hypocrite needs to be but in the house of the Lord. Huh? 1987. Chalk that down. <laughs> right? We have to see people just like Christ sees us. His image. His image. There was a time you walked and talked and did exactly how they, and thought the way they think. But your mindset's been changed. There's been a renewing of your mind, as they say in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Your mindset's changed. Why is that? Because your heart's been changed through the gospel of Jesus Christ. So you have to see your coworkers in the image of God. And number five, you got to serve others. Save people, serve people. So that served people will become saved people. Served people serve people. I didn't come up with that. It's real. You got to serve them. Not because you're asking anything in return. I had a co-worker the other day came to me. Matter of fact, it was the weekend of the youth conference. My son's in-laws were on that wonderful, glorious trip called Hawaii. And we had all three kids, grandkids. And my great son, Tyler, said, Rob, this is what I need you to do for me. Come up here late. Take our guys to the hotel. Then go early Saturday morning, pick them up, and take them to the airport. I said, well, how late is late? Oh, about 1030. No. We left the church at 12. Got home, got up early, took them to the airport. All three lanes on 65 all the way down to the old Hickory Boulevard exit was shut down. Yeah. But my co-worker said, Rob, he said, uh, I'm, I'm trying to get some people to help me pick up some hay uh, on the farm. My dad's down, whatever. He said, would you be interested in coming to help serve? And I said, listen, man, 
I would, but I've got three grandbabies this weekend, and I've been asked to do this at our youth conference this weekend. I said, but listen, if I can't do it, I can get someone that can. And I said, well, man, we got some wonderful teenagers at church that I can call. And I'm going, no, I can't. They're at a conference this weekend. A few minutes later, he came to me. He said, Rob, we're good. I got plenty of help. Thank you so much. Thank you for just be willing to serve. Serve them. How you do that in your own way, that's on you. But save people, serve people. So that serve people will become saved people. We believe in serving here at GC. It doesn't just bless you because you get to do it. But you are a blessing to others because you get to do it. Somebody served you coffee today. They did that because they wanted to, not because they had to. Serve people. Serve, save people, serve people. Now, if you recognize the outline of the message this morning, it's spelled blessed, B-L-E-S-S. And when I began to prepare for this, I thought of one of the greatest, if not the greatest message ever preached. It comes from Matthew chapter 5 in verse 9. This is known as the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus preached it. Notice what it says. God blesses those who work. Circle. Underline. Highlight. God blesses those who work for peace for they will be called the children of God. Those who work for peace. One translation calls us peacemakers. So let me challenge you with this question. When you go to work, are you a peacemaker? When you go to work, you say, well, I'm there to work. I'm not there to do ministry. Well, your work can be your ministry. If you allow it to be. Your work can be a place where you can change lives. If you're allowed to be. You say, well, Rob, how do you know? Because I know. Fred Rogers, if you grew up as a kid and watched Sesame Street, there was another show that followed Sesame Street. It was called Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. And Fred Rogers, one of his many quotes, he said this. All we're ever asked to do in this life is to treat our neighbor, especially our neighbor who is in need, exactly as we would hope to be treated ourselves. This is our ultimate responsibility. So do we have a responsibility at our workplace? Yes, we do. That person that's impatient with you, doesn't mean that you have to be impatient with him or her. That person that doesn't like you, doesn't mean that you can't like or love her or him. That person that talks bad, doesn't mean you have to talk bad. That person that's talking about somebody, I don't mean you have to jump in and talk about somebody. You're changing the culture at your workplace. Because, see, we believe here at GC, our plan here at GC is to practice the way of Jesus. Where we live, where we work, and where we play. We practice it. We live it out. How do you know it works? It may not work on every occasion, but it does work. How do you know, Rob? I'm glad you asked. There's a wonderful couple that I met. They're going to put the picture of them on the screen. You may know them. This is Levi and Ashley Wyatt and their daughter Savannah. As you can tell, she was expecting. And just recently, they just gave, she just gave birth to their son, Sutton. I met Levi about 15 years ago on the golf course down here at Dogwood Hills while I was on staff at another church. I was playing for some church people, part of my congregation. We were playing in a tournament, and I met Levi 15 years ago. At the moment that I met Levi, he was going through a very dark period. Him and his wife had separated. They were going through a divorce. 
Levi was going through a tough time. And while we was up there on the putting green, waiting for our turn to putt, I just reached over to him and said, listen, brother, I'm praying for you. I want to encourage you to hang in there. Tough problems don't last, just tough people. Hang in there, brother. If you need me, I'm available to have conversation with. We finished off our golf game. Saw him a couple more times. Again, continued to encourage him. But around 2017 or so, I met Ashley. I was working at Unipress. And I was getting moved to a different department. I transferred to another department. And my job was to train Ashley on my job, on my machine. So I got to for two weeks. At that time, Phyllis and I, we were connected to one of our churches that we're connected to, Strong Tower Church there in Westmoreland. We were serving over there. And I met Ashley, and it was close to Christmas, so I invited her to come to our Christmas experience there at Strong Tower. And the first thing she asked me was, well, what do I wear? I said, man, you can wear what you got on, you know. It don't matter. She said, well, I had to go and talk to my boyfriend about it. I said, well, who's your boyfriend? She said, Levi Wyatt. I said, what? She had moved up here from Smyrna. That's how they met. And guess what, church? Not only did they come to the Christmas experience, but she asked me, she said, Rob, Levi said that we're going to come. She said, can he bring his family with him? He's got family coming down from Indiana to spend Christmas. Can they come? I said, why, sure, certainly. How many they got coming? Fifteen. They filled up three rows. And even today, when they come down during Christmas, they go to Strong Tire as a part of that service. But at the time, Ashley and Levi, they didn't have a fellowship with Christ they sooner did they come to know him as Lord and Savior of their life and I had the privilege of baptizing both of them but church it doesn't stop there six months later Levi called me and said Rob I'm proposing to Ashley when she says yes I'd be honored if you did the ceremony. So sure enough, I did. Right up the road here at Crafton Barn, I officiated their marriage ceremony. And now they both are connected to Strong Tower Church, serving in their children's ministry with two beautiful children added to their family. I said that to say this. Don't tell me that you can't make an impact at your workplace. Lives are forever changed if we'll just live out the fruits of the Spirit where we work, where we live, and where we play. It's a game changer.